Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and in today's interview, I'm talking to crime and mystery author L.J. Ross about Lindisfarne, the Holy Island, and some of the other fascinating places in the northeast of England that feature in Louise's books. So we met here in Bath, so we had friends in real life as such, but Louise also moved back to her home uh, in the northeast a year or so later. So I asked her about that idea of home, because when we met in Bath, we'd both kind of moved here and we were both finding our place. And I have found my place here, but she didn't. And that's always really interesting, the emotional resonance of places over time. And this particularly fascinates me for this podcast as I'm doing the personal shows and reflecting on places I've lived. And I've lived in a lot of different places in the world. But weirdly, uh, well, not weirdly, I mean, I was born in Somerset and I'm now living in Somerset, which is a county in England. And I went to school in Bristol, which is just to the west of here. Uh, So I have also come home after a lot of travels. I have come home to Somerset. Now, I've always been a southerner. And although Louise has only a slight accent, she's got a beautiful voice, you might be able to hear a difference between our voices. So yeah, I really hope you enjoy the differences in this interview. So I'm also slightly ashamed because even though she lives, uh, well, it's about seven hours drive, I guess, um, but you can fly up from where I am. I have not been to the places she's talking about. And uh, I've explored more of Australia and New Zealand than I have of England, which I must remedy. (laughs) But this is often the case. Maybe that's similar for you too, is that you know other places more that or you've traveled in other places more than your own home country. So on Lindisfarne, I actually wrote about Lindisfarne in Day of the Vikings, which is a modern thriller about neo-Vikings who invade the British Museum. But Lindisfarne is in the book as it was one of the sites of a well-documented Viking raid and is also famous for the Lindisfarne Gospels, which were created in the 8th century in the monastery on the island and now reside in the British Library. And I can highly recommend, so if you're in London, they have uh, the British Library, they have the Treasures Room and they have things like the Lindisfarne Gospels and a whole load of other things that often are in rotation. Just some incredible manuscripts. So yeah, I hope you enjoy the interview with Louise. LJ Ross is the international best-selling author of the DCI Ryan mystery series set in the northeast of England, including UK number one bestseller, Holy Island. Hello, Louise. Hello there. Oh, it's so good to have you on the show. So first of all, tell us a bit more about you and your exciting geographic history, because you've tried a lot of places, haven't you? Yeah, I haven't done too badly, I have to say. Yes. Um, Well, I was uh, born and grew up in Northumberland. Um, So I was there until I was 18. And then I went off to university in London. And I was down in London uh, on and off for about 12 years, um, if I have that number correctly. I think it gets to a tipping point where you then have to check your own dates. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yes, about 12 years. Um, During that time, I also did um, just under a year in Paris. Um, and then I did a few months in Florence as well. So um, hop, skipped and jumped a little bit. Um, throughout that time, my family had actually relocated to Cornwall for about eight years as well. So while I was in London, I then got to kind of vicariously explore Cornwall. Um, I have a younger sister who's 12 years younger as well. So I would get back quite frequently and see them. So that was quite nice as well to get out of the city during that period. Um, And we traveled quite a lot. Um, My, you know, my then partner, now husband, James and I, we traveled quite a bit during that time before we had um, our son. And then after London, after Ethan was born, um, we kind of found that we'd we'd really enjoy London. But I think both of us having uh, been brought up in, in the country, I think we'd sort of 
enjoyed our time there, but we're coming to a point where, you know, we we needed to sort of smell the fresh air again, as it were. So um, we moved outside and took a tentative step outside of London to Hertfordshire because at that time, James T still needed to get back into London for work and things. Um, and we were there for about a year. Um, and then after Hertfordshire, we moved over to Bath, which is uh, where you were. And that's where we met, actually. Um, and we loved our time in Bath as well. It's a very beautiful city. Um, and we were there about, I think, just under two years. Um, and then we we came back around full circle and we have wound our way back up to Northumberland now, which is um, where I'm speaking to you from. <laughs> Yeah, which is fantastic. And I wanted to talk to you partly because of this idea of, um, you know, traveling as part of this show. But I think a lot of the time you need to travel out from home. And I wonder, yes. so you've you've basically returned home. So do you now mm -hmm. see Northumberland as as home? Or, and, and what does that feel like to kind of be back off? I mean, the, the, the South is quite different. You know, what does it feel like mm -hmm. to be home? Is it home? Well, I think I say this with the benefit of hindsight. I mean, I, I would I would generally say, you know, um, home is wherever, you know, uh, you and uh, your loved ones put your hat, as it were. I think that that is genuinely true. I think that if you are happy within your own skin, you could probably make a home anywhere. You know, I think that there's a, a good level of truth to that. But in terms of Northumberland, I think it's also safe to say in my case that, again, with hindsight, I look back and, and I think Northumberland's always going to be home to me because even when I wasn't living there, you know, I um, set all my books there and I would get back as often as I could. And I would just, for my own pleasure, be seeking out new places in Northumberland or, in fact, rediscovering places that I knew as a child. So my heart was definitely sort of leaning in that direction and it has been for years, you know, so I think my head and my heart were always sort of uh, grounded in this part of the world um, and that imprint was there from from childhood um, where we are now yes we've we've moved back up here and um, very happy here but I think you know what what I would say about our family is we, we love to travel and we love to sort of spread our wings wherever possible I think it's the case that in the future um, as we move into different stages of our lives and, and as opportunity arises we probably would um, sort of hop skip and jump away and then probably return again you know I think it's somewhere that I'll always have an emotional and probably also a physical base um, and and somewhere that I'd always Always sort of be drawn back to periodically over my lifetime. Mm. Yeah, and you're right about the places that are emotionally resident, uh, resonant often end up in our books. So mm -hmm. we'll, come yes. back to, we'll come back to your books in a minute. But I wondered also, um, many people understand or, you know, or they might hear the difference in our accents. I mean, not, neither of mm -hmm. us are particularly broad, but there is a difference in our accents. Do you mm -hmm. think there are diff real differences between northerners um, and mm -hmm. southerners? Are there really different geographical personalities in the UK? Well, I just think this is a lot of this is kind of anecdotal, isn't it? I mean, people in the UK do speak about there being um, regional differences between people. And as you say, you can hear the differences sometimes. Um, for example, Northerners, um, depending on who you speak to, can either be recognised as, as really down to earth, unpretentious, um, probably easy to speak to, all of those things. And I, I think they did a, a call centre um, poll a while back and apparently a lot of Geordie the call centre operators are hired specifically because they're trustworthy on the phone, you know, <laughs> something like this. I mean, I don't know whether that's true at all, but it's um, it's an interesting comment on on those sort of supposed differences. But I actually don't think um, that any of the, the real su substance will be different between people, because wherever there's a community, whether it be north or south, I think that you will you'll get those personalities wherever you go. You get people who who gel together and who are loyal and who, and who will sort of rally behind their own community and and you know you've probably found this maybe with your books as well that you know when you put something out there if people recognize something in that or you're a local writer or any of those things they will really sort of get behind you and support you and that's that's really just a human nature trait you know as opposed to being a regional one um but i think in general yes you're right if the northerners we are known for being maybe quite hardy as well i mean it is quite cold <laughs> So, you know, I will say that that is something, you know, we have to be quite a hardy type. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, and, and as I say, quite unpretentious, you know, we will we'll speak to anybody who quite social types, really. Yeah, fantastic. So your first novel, Holy Island, which is how I came to know your writing. I'm a sucker. Mm-hmm. Anything with the word holy in, I'm going to read. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I picked that up as soon as I saw it. And um, that book set on Lindisfarne, which yes. I've, I've also written about, but many people might not know about it. So tell mm-hmm. us what is special about Lindisfarne and any tips for people who want to visit? Sure. So Lindisfarne is a tiny tidal causeway island off uh, the northeastern coast. So if uh, if you do know anything about the geography of the United Kingdom, it's somewhere between Newcastle on that eastern coastline and Edinburgh. So not as far north as Edinburgh, but it's sort of halfway between getting up that way. So if you take a train journey between Newcastle and Edinburgh anytime, you would look out across the sea. And if you're lucky on a clear day, you'd see this lovely little island kind of peeping up from the North Sea. And it's quite a chameleon because, you know, depending on the weather um, and and often in the Northeast, as I've said, you know, you're going to get sort of um, thrashing waves and and a lot of, um, you know, stormy weather, which which can change quite quickly to just being beautiful blue skies. So it's quite a chameleon like that. Um, and the island, um, therefore, if you're on it, can can be quite isolating, but in a really spiritual way. You know, and um, and obviously its first recorded history is, is way back in the sixth century. And, and people clearly felt the same when I say spiritual. Um, I'm not religious myself, but I can understand why it drew people to that island because, um, you know, it, it has a, a, a peacefulness to it um, with the sort of surrounding sea on every side and, and you being closeted on this beautiful little patch of earth um, that seems to have just been dropped from the sky it it has a lot to it that I think um, people can relate to and feel at home with and and sort of get back to um, without wanting to sound too much like John Mage back to basics you know you can go there and you can really sort of strip back your um, your social media life and and really sort of and have a peaceful time there so um, yes that's the island and it uh, as I say has a really long recorded history Um, it's also known for being the location of probably the first recorded Viking raid on the United Kingdom. Um, and so, you you know, you've got the ruined priory there. You've got this beautiful little castle, Lindisfarne Castle. And it's also, on a literary sense, got a long history as well, because it's been the inspiration for, you know, several well-known writers, uh, not least you and I, Joanna, but <laughs> also also George, uh, George R. R. Martin and um, Tolkien. You know, um, he, he saw Lindisfarne Castle and was inspired the two towers, you know, because from Lindisfarne, you can look across the water and see Bamburgh Castle, that really mighty fortress down there, which at one stage in time was um, was the capital. You know, it was um, a capital uh, for, for the first kings of England. So it's a really commanding position against the sea. And, and you really do, you do feel that geography when you're there. Yeah. And um, is that Bam- Bamburgh Castle mm-hmm. from Bernard Cornwell's uh, series yes. as well? Yes, yes, and um, and actually, it's 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 it wins quite a lot of you know tourism awards because you go there and it's it's just um, as I say a very commanding spot and it's it's built on this um, old bit of volcanic rock you know which um, juts out into the sea and, and then they've got the castle on top which has been kind of improved over the centuries and um, and you can just see for miles around you know it's what you might call a really a proper castle <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes I, I agree yes I think Bernard Cornwell used that as um, inspiration too. Yeah. And just back on um, Lindisfarne, you mentioned it's tidal. So mm-hmm. if people are visiting, do they have to be careful when they cross over? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, on a sort of monthly basis, you do see local reports about there being stranded cars because it's quite a long causeway. So it looks deceptively short when you get to the crossing um, from the mainland, but you do really need to check ahead and and they change daily. I would advise people to have a look on uh, the Northumberland County Council website because they publish all of the times well in advance. So you can still plan your trip quite far in advance, really. And they're very accurate as well. So, yeah, yeah, and I've (laughs) I've seen, you know, exactly. Um, And, you know, you get, you you do see these pictures and and every time someone's car is stranded and the water level rises, not only is it quite a scary thing to happen, but they have to to call up a a helicopter all the way from Hull. So, you know, there's not one sitting right there. So, you know. (laughs) Well, 
I definitely. kind of I love that because so often now with visiting places, especially pl- places that are well known, it's it's mm-hmm. very safe. You know, there's no danger, and this no. is like the water is coming. You cannot stop yes. the sea, and it adds to the it adds to the mystery, doesn't it? You know, it's brilliant. It definitely gives it something. You know that, as you say, that sense of danger, having to put the accelerator down as you, <laughs> as you escape quick, everybody up. Um, okay, so um, the other books in the DCI Ryan Crime series are yeah. mainly set in Northumbria. So, of course, we mentioned the castle, but what are some of the other places that have inspired you in your writing there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm spoiled for choice, really, that you've got Hadrian's Wall. Um, and so my second book in that series, Sycamore Gap, is is named after that quite famous dip in the wall with the sycamore tree growing right in the centre. And people might kind of recognise that more readily from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. You know, that's where Kevin oh, Costner yes. and Morgan Freeman walked. So, yeah, that's that's kind of in more of the popular television mind. But um, yes, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. It's very remote, very scenic. And, um, you know, obviously you've got quite a lot of Roman history around those parts. But when I was walking there, because it's not very far from either where I grew up or where I live now, actually, it's only about three miles away. Um, I I just sort of remember thinking to myself, they're still uncovering quite a lot archaeologically in terms of uh, old Roman relics um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's an obvious thing for a crime writer then to then think, well, if they're still uncovering things, I wonder whether they might uncover something a lot more modern, you know, mm. um, and you've got miles and miles of wall in which to potentially hide something because it's quite thick and it's quite old and there's a lot of um, vegetation as well. So, so yes, you know, things can easily turn dark in the mind of a crime writer <laughs> if you have that particular <laughs> bent. Um, but it is also a beautiful, beautiful spot. So that's very inspiring just, again, in terms of looking around you and thinking, I wonder what happened here uh, over well, the course of centuries where I where I'm walking now, who else has walked the same path, you know? Um and then places like Cragside moving more towards um, Victorian history in the area because it's got a very uh, established Victorian history as well as an industrial town of Newcastle. And um, that was really brought on through the industrial era through um, Armstrong, which is first Baron Armstrong, who built his main uh, summer house um in the middle of what you might have described as, as quite a barren landscape, but if you visit it now, it's one of the most verdant, lush um, forests in, in the region. It's because he and his wife planted all of that. They imported all kinds of unique tree specimens and they built up this incredible new landscape. And it has one of the biggest rock gardens, I think, in Europe. Um, aside from that, because he had this incredible um, wealth, I suppose, he um, built the city of Newcastle as, as we would know it now. He built the train station, you know, all of the kind of um, Victorian streets, all of that sort of history. But the castle, well, I call it a castle because it looks a little bit like um, one of those German Bavarian style castles. Mm. It's not quite in terms of its architecture, but it certainly has shades of it, you know, and it's, again, built into the rock. So it's on different levels and it's really higgledy-piggledy and it has this sort of slightly faux Tudor facade, which sounds like a real mishmash, but really somehow works against all of the, of the, of the forest behind it. It was also the first place in the world to be um, lit by hydroelectric power. So he was a real kind of engineer and he had the means to explore all of his kind of inventive ideas. You know, so he had, I don't know, a Turkish bath there. He had um, this Archimedes screw that was powering the whole house with these old light bulbs. So it's got a fantastic feel and it's extremely Victorian when you go inside, by which I mean, you know, it's quite dark. There's a lot of red, but there are incredible collections um, museum collections that is that he acquired over the years and just as a feat of engineering it's it's definitely worth seeing mm, cool it sounds quite steampunk actually <laughs> oh yeah definitely yeah <laughs> um, so let's um you mentioned newcastle um and your books angel and the infirmary are set in newcastle so people mm-hmm. may have seen some kind of gritty um you know the, it's often portrayed as a very gritty place in, yes, in yeah. sort of crime tv series that so kind what, of get carter <laughs> yeah so what are some of the interesting places to visit in in the newcastle the city itself 
Well, for me, um, I mean, when I was writing the infirmary, I absolutely loved exploring um, what's known as the Victoria Tunnel, which is essentially a subterranean wagonway. So, um, you know, the city of Newcastle has quite a long shipping history, but it also has a coal mining history um, that, you know, that brought in quite a lot of wealth in days gone by. And so this wagonway beneath the city um, very similar size to maybe one of the tube tunnels, you know. Um, it was built to transport coal from um, the northwest of the city all the way down to the river on the other side without having to disturb the streets with this constant flow of traffic. So it's built on a slight incline. Um, so they kind of knew what they were doing, you know. Um, but there are these great stories. I mean, you go inside because you can take a tour now. Um, and it's, it is quite eerie. You know, it's very dark. It's, it's lit for the purposes of the tour, um, but only so far. So you really do get a feel of, of what it might have been, uh, been like. And I mean, during both world wars, it was also used as um, bomb raid shelters. So they built these blast walls. And I managed to incorporate that into the story because if you're just walking along and the light, which if there were none, it would be utter darkness. Um, if you're walking along and then suddenly a wall just appears in front of you in this <laughs> tunnel and you can't quite, and I mean, the gap around it is so slim. Um, you sort of, you wouldn't immediately know how to how to get out of it, you know. So for, again, for a crime writer, there's plenty to work with there. There's a lot of um, claustrophobia in that. Um and it's, again, got quite a lot of history. I mean, there are stories from the coal mining days about um, accidents. I mean, it's a bit like a roller coaster, I suppose, you know, and if you're on the wrong end of that at any point, then disaster would strike. So, so yes, there's quite a lot of interesting history from that side of things. Um, and I mean, growing up, I had actually no idea that the Victoria Tunnel even existed. Um, but I'm so pleased that, you know, they've invested in, in that now and people can take tours and understand a bit about the history of the city. Um, other parts that I really enjoy seeing, um, I mean, obviously, you've got the usual theatre royal, things like that. But actually, for me, um, it's down on the quayside on both sides because the River Tyne separates Newcastle to the north and Gateshead to the south. And on Gateshead side, you know, you have this incredible um, music venue called the Sage, which is just enormous glass structure, which was built a few years ago. And they have some great names come there. And that's on that side. But then looking across the other direction um, towards the mouth of the sea um, on, a, on a foggy day, there is definitely fog on the time. <laughs> oh, I was going <laughs> to say, know, it's in my head. Oh, you started I know. it. <laughs> I, 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 won't, I won't sing it for you. But, you know, there are like uh, just, I think it's Seven Bridges along there. Um, and actually I named one of my books is called Seven Bridges and it's all about um, that locale and um, and somebody who gets it into their head to um, to hold the city to ransom. Otherwise, they, they start blowing up these bridges, you know. Um, and it's beautiful because they work in such a way. I mean, some of them are date back to Armstrong's time. So you're looking at Victorian bridges. But there's always been a bridge there uh, right the way back to Roman times. So again, it's the history looking at it. And there's a sort of aesthetic to it that works so well. You know, they each, when you stand at one side and look down the river, they each just work work very much like an abstract painting, you know, and each kind of moves in together. And so I do, I enjoy going down that way. And they have things like fairs on on a Sunday and, and markets. And it's all, it's so um, nostalgic, I would say, but without being old fashioned, you know, I think it's definitely, it's modern produce, it's, it's modern businesses, but there's a sort of scent on the air of, of the sea, you know. Mm. And so there's a, there's a lot of that in the city um, and down there on the quayside in particular is one of my favourite places to go. Mm. Well, you've made Newcastle seem really romantic. Which... <laughs> <laughs> I know. People don't think of it because of its industrial history, but I do. I could, oh, yeah, there's amazing sort of hidden, hidden kind of nooks and crannies. There's a lot of great Victorian history to it. Yeah, fantastic. Now, when I was, because um, of course I've been reading your other books, but I was looking at your website and I saw you've got another series coming about a psychological profiler, which looks oh, nice. to be pretty international, like much more international mm -hmm. than, than, the, than the Ryan series. So yeah. how, how are you weaving your past travels or your future travels into those books? And tell us about those books. Well, this is quite an exciting venture, actually, um, because obviously I decided I wasn't busy enough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, well, I mean, I had actually, um, I had done before, well, while I was writing Holy Island, I did, uh, while I was pregnant to keep myself busy, I suppose, um, I did a postgraduate diploma in psychology and I really enjoyed the elements of, um, you know, abnormal psychology and the clinical side and thought seriously about maybe retraining to be a forensic psychologist or something of that ilk. 
Um, but then I wrote Holy Arnold and the rest is history. But I've always had an interest in psychology and I, I love all of the kind of true drama that's been out and, you know, reading about um, Mind Hunter and The Jigsaw Man and a lot of these great books. And it's an interesting history of criminal profiling in the United Kingdom because, you know, a while back in the in the 90s, you know, they tried to set up this uh, forensic profiling unit, which was intended to be the UK equivalent of uh, the behavioral sciences unit at the FBI. Um, but it never quite got off the ground um, in the UK uh, for various reasons. And so I kind of was always intrigued by this. And I was thinking how much of it is a science and how much of it is just, you know, hocus, you know. So I, as a character, um, I wanted to write my character as a skeptic himself, you know, um, rather than being somebody who uh, felt that he could go into any situation and sort of wave a magic wand. I wanted him to to be skeptical of his own skills to a degree and to see himself as a clinician first and a profiler second, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's been fun to write. But from a travel perspective, it's been a lot of fun because, um, you know, in, in the new stories, um, I can weave in all of my of my time in Paris, for example. One of the stories is going to be set there. And, um, you know, I spent a little bit of time in Ireland, which I love, um, the islands in Scotland as well, um, and also a little bit of upstate New York. That's just, that's a pet project of mine, and I intend to to visit that a little more. I've been to New York several times over the years, but not so much up towards the Catskills and that sort of side to it. But I definitely want to push out. I mean, the beauty of this series, and that's something that I'm looking forward to, is because my character will be a consultant and he will basically go, depending where the work is around the world, that means I can set it in small villages in the middle of nowhere versus major cities, you know, and then well-known ones. So it's a nice balance between um, city storytelling and an exploring um, kind of tiny parts of, of the world, you know, um, which I'm looking forward to to doing over the coming years. Oh, I'm really excited about those because I also have a postgrad uh, diploma in psychology. So um, wow. yeah, we share that <laughs> interest. So I'm really excited about those. I mean, they're not out as we talk now. They're not out. But is there um, a title that people can watch out for or a character or how can they find those in the future? Yes. Yeah, so the first three books, the first one is going to be called Imposter. And the second is Hysteria. And the third is Bedlam. So um, I know they're all very, uh, yeah, (laughs) hopefully. (laughs) Um, So the first one should be out, fingers crossed, around uh, the end of October. Um, So we'll be sort of launching towards uh, the late part of the year um, and into Christmas as well. So uh, So that's October 2019 as we record this. And uh, if people are listening in the future, those books will be out, which is exciting. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I wanted to ask you a broader question Um, because this show is all about books and travel and Mm -hmm. the kind of uh, the the, the bigger questions about travel. So what what does travel mean to you as as both a a person and a mom and and also a writer? Mm. Well, I think travel is a question of um, seeing the world as a sort of one world, you know, um, rather than being narrow minded. I think it's easy if you stay in the same place. uh, you know, your your whole life, I think there's a, a danger that you could become very insular and, and maybe only see a kind of echo chamber of your own views because people tend to, if they live in the same area, they tend to maybe reflect a lot of the shared opinions of that area um, politically and otherwise. Um, whereas I think if you travel, I, I think it's no, reading is great, but it's also no substitute for maybe going out there and seeing the world for yourself as much as possible. Um, of course, it's it's all a question of what people are able to do. Um, but with the kind of media access that we have now, at least even online, there's there's more and more opportunity to, to experience other parts of the world, even by proxy. Um, but in my case, I've been fortunate and, and my family as well um, to be able to travel where we where we can. I mean, we have a son who's five, so it's around the school schedule now. Um, but we do. We like to plan ahead and to show him different parts of the world um, so that he develops more of a world view. Um, I think, you know, without getting too political about things, I, I think it just helps in the future to to understand why people develop um views that are different to your own. And rather than, um, you know, seeing the world in, in black and white, it's about understanding the shades of grey. And 
and also assisting in in terms of um, understanding the history of a place and why people and even the geography of a place why it's developed in the way that it has. Um, bringing it back to Northumberland, even I look I look at the landscape around here and I know that there's an an enormous volcanic sill that runs all the way from North Sea all the way underneath Hadrian's Wall, and so that's why you'll see. The landscape jutting up as it does in a really dramatic way, um, and understanding that and looking that, and you know, in in the centuries gone by, perhaps people settling here and seeing how they could use that landscape defensively and, and all the rest of that, taking that approach and then exploring the world with the same eyes and understanding how people have traditionally moved and been quite sort of nomadic in that sense uh, and I suppose going all the way back people have always had nomadic tendencies um, because they needed to go where the food was and where sustenance was and and that was an outlook um, obviously with the advances that we have now people don't necessarily travel in that way um, just for basic sustenance but um, you know I think there's something to be said for understanding that that's our shared history um, and again, coming back to what I said at the start, looking at the world as one world as opposed to factions within a world. Mm, fantastic. So apart from your own books, what are some other books you would recommend that people read uh, that are set in the northeast? Sure. Well, um, we're kind of, again, spoilt for choice, but I'll whittle it down. Um, if you're looking for something nonfiction, I can highly recommend any of Max Adams's books. Um, so he wrote The King in the North is one of them, um, which is a fantastically, I would say, a really well-researched but accessible historical book, um, which breaks down the story of uh, King Oswald, who's, you know, the really famous king in um, in the Northeast back in the day. And he served as inspiration for Tolkien's Aragorn. So, you know, it's it's fantastic um, in terms of its storytelling, um, but it's breaking down the facts of history in a way that is almost like reading just a really great story, you know, which I think is quite a skill uh, for a historian. So I really enjoy his work. Um, Another one I would recommend is uh, a writer called Nikki Black. It's very, very different in terms of style. It's it's very firmly fictional. um, And you're looking at, I would say it's almost like uh, pop fiction because her first book, The Prodigal, is broadly speaking a crime novel, but I think it's it's much more about relationships and it's based in the 90s as well. So it's got that um, ashes to ashes sort of feel to it. You know, mm. when, you're, when you're reading it, she's got a fantastic skill at really setting the scene. So you feel that you're stepping back into the 90s when you read the book, you know. And so it's Newcastle back in the 90s. Um, and her other book, The, the Rave, is going back slightly further again. And it's that rave culture in the 90s and fantastic dialogue, very cinematic dialogue between the characters and um, really good storytelling there. And then finally, I think I would probably, um, I'd recommend uh, Howard Linsky, who's Penguin published author, who has written uh, historical novels actually as well, but is probably best known for his uh, crime fiction writing based uh, in the Northeast. He's originally from County Durham, but I think he lives actually down in Welland, uh, in Hertfordshire now, with his family. But he writes still about the Northeast, and I know I know how it supports Newcastle United still for his sins, and you know. <laughs> so you know, again, that's really really great storytelling, but with a slightly different onus because his characters uh, in one of his series are um, are news reporters and they work in tandem with the police. So it's looking at a crime from a slightly different perspective as opposed to just, you know, the detective or, or whoever. So yeah, he's got a, a really good gritty style as well. So if you enjoy things that are, you know, edging more towards Get Carter, then that's, that's a really good option. Is there one of his books that you would recommend particularly? I think I would start with um, Max Adams um, because I think it gives you a really, really great overview um, without being, uh, you know, too dense. Um, It gives you a a great flavour of the area and, and as I said, just uh, gives you a feeling of where people have come from. Mm, Fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? Well, they're all on Amazon. Uh, obviously, I, I actually publish um, using their KDP platform. So yes, they're all online in ebook and paperback and also in audiobook. So I hope they enjoy them. And your website? Yes, it's www.ljrossauthor.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Louise. That was great. Lovely. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.